is also very much present uh, throughout the text. And uh, basically, I think that the, the, the point of this text regarding freedom is that uh, the romantic notion of freedom um, that we can discuss later in, in, in more detail uh, has been uh, perversely commoditized by the current art world. So basically the idea of you know, of this sort of double ambivalent legacy of romanticism uh, introduced in the first part is uh, given more uh, specificity, more flesh in, in the second part when uh, the authors talk about freedom in particular. Um, so I think perhaps it's not really a summary, but uh, I, I suggest we could perhaps uh, talk about this notion of freedom as Vasily suggested, in in uh, in a slightly more detailed way, perhaps referring to the text itself. So, um, so let me. Any, then... any, anyone want to say anything? Do Do you want to go paragraph by paragraph? And having a look at the first first paragraph, seeing, try to understand what's what is the argument, what's the what's the question here uh, that is uh, raised by Yafus. Yeah, so okay, paragraph by paragraph. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, so in the first, you see that in in the very beginning of the text, they introduce the. Uh, at least the freedom is is mentioned for the first time right so the, the the argument continues the line from the previous part about how uh the romantic legacy is based on this idea of uh, genius of of some creative uh, agent right uh which can be individual or collective um and which is the source of art and of uh of the works of art um and so 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 the text begins with this proposition that the very conception of freedom that once drove the various avant-garde's has come to regulate a logic of commoditization, uh, or it has encouraged us to see that logic of commoditization as the definition of freedom itself. Uh, and so the, the idea is that uh, the art world uh, is sort of based on uh, a particular understanding of this romantic notion of freedom, as uh, being uh, the ultimate sort of attribute of the creative agent of the individual individual artist, um, and uh, everything function functions as if uh, you know this idea of an individual artist and of the art being the uh, product of an individual brain were actually true. Um, yeah, Vasily, would you like to? Yeah, well, so obviously that's clearly not the freedom that the Museum of Care wants to uh, promote. Um, there is also another idea in this first paragraph, which is about um, the idea that if you take out this um, uh, structure of inequality and violence, maybe you, you're going to, you know, we're all going to end up uh, like artists, which is which is probably, I mean, I, I, I would not agree with this uh, idea. Um, um, I mean, I, I don't know. And, and this is, I think, what David was saying about the, the, the nature of, 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 um, of men. Uh, are we really going to, um, are, are we really, you know, are we, are we selfish by nature or are we, um, 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 are we um, uh, driven by this, um, you know, by, by, by this, um, I don't know, a desire of, of, of helping people. We actually don't know what is what, what is what is clear though is that when you we talk with um, we, we are kind of uh, taught that we are actually uh, selfish uh, uh, by by nature. Anyone want to say something about that about this first paragraph? Uh, is the idea then that uh, uh, a romantic sort of approach to art is elitist in some way and if it becomes a commodity is that the fault of the artist or is it systemic is it beyond their control anyone anyone wants to reply to that nika wanted yeah i want to reply but then i want to come back to and ask uh, vasily what he meant 
uh, yeah, it's systemic. At least that's what we were writing. It's uh, how art all built and it's a reflection of the bigger social economic system. But uh, original romantic ideas wasn't uh, about artists being this individual genius. They were the guys who invented the concept of culture and national culture. So it was more about genius in everybody, kind of collective genius more than individual um, person. And so later we were talking about how uh, interestingly these two ideas of uh, individual genius was born simultaneously with the idea of um, um, assembly um, uh, factory worker. And so factory worker is somebody very anonymous. We don't know nothing about him somewhere things are produced. But then we know everything about uh, Woody Guthrie or you know all these nice people that we want to meet for lunch. Um, nobody wants to meet uh, uh, a factory worker from you know Oklahoma, Illinois, or something like that. So, and, but it was simultaneously born at the same time. So I I didn't um, understand what Vasily was. Um, saying and i want to ask oh, clarification it, about artists yeah why why uh, oh, how how it's connected to being being selfish the idea of i was that. just referring to this sentence he said you know men could uh, in the future society in which forms of institutional violence are rooted out become artists once again uh, to mm. me i think it goes back directly to the question of human um, you know the nature of uh, human beings and you have no, in, in, the, no. in the anarchist literature, you have this very long tradition where, uh, you know, you have the, the anarchist saying to the Marxist, basically, oh, no, you know, human nature is actually not that. Um, uh, it's solidarity that matters, you know, uh, um, if you if you read Kropotkin or, or, or and it tried to be, you know, to to um, to develop an idea that, you know, uh, of human nature being different from uh, the economies of, of or, or traditional political economy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but uh, I think they're talking about uh, of all human society be run more by solidarity than by competition. But uh, the idea that everybody is an artist, like future people, Budit Lani, uh, the, the future people in Russian avant-garde tradition, being an artist or being a creative person, and in this case, they don't separate uh, being artist from being scientist, specifically prolipkul. Um, it doesn't mean you're a good person, you know, you, you could be nasty maybe, but you still could be creative. So it's, uh, it's not about uh, good nature. So if we believe in good nature of the humans, then the moment uh, capitalism will be gone, everybody would become like, uh, you know, nice and Hello. Um, Young wants to intervene. Yeah. yeah. Hello. I'm, I'm first time visitor. I will. <laughs> How are you all? Um, I read the articles just very quickly just now. I, I think that to, to talk about freedom um, in, these, in the context of these articles, it's really important to also talk about scarcity and how freedom is restricted and how the art wor world, how the art structures of the art market um, um, valorize the freedom of certain individuals and, and, um, and raise them to the level of creators and then somehow make that undesirable or impossible for everybody else to realize in their own lives. So, um, so that ultimate creativity that's valorized by, that's, that's you know, you know a, um, attributed to the artist, the creator, um, that that then sort of cascades down as an ideology which regulates how we are to see ourselves as not creators or or not artists. Um, so um, I mean, and and the the kind of the the vision of like the you know the Malevichs uh, uh, would be to say actually, or or, or you know Soviet Russia um, at times would be to say um, 
and the, and that lovely vignette of like you know all these street sweepers having only you know hours in the day to be what do whatever they like right um it's 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 an abundance of that freedom versus a restriction of that freedom to certain individuals isn't it Thank you. After, after, after Will, um, Yash wanted to say something. Do you want to react to that? Yes, I, I, so I think I had a similar thought, you know, because I think like, like, you know, like, yeah, in this paragraph, especially one interesting thing uh, is about how like the romantic ideal of, you know, everyone as an artist gets transformed into individual artists, you know, like the valorization. So, you know, I was kind of thinking about like possibly a sort of conservatism that goes hand in hand with that change, right? Where like how how does it that, that change get made from collective to individual and maybe one approach is that it's it's you know it, it, maybe it's like the conservative notion that everyone is not born as an artist but everyone is born in a sort of primal state you know because you know typically a lot of times people associate you know creativity with chaos and like this elementary state of nature so the idea is that you know we're not all born artists but we are born sort of uh, like in a really chaotic state that needs to be really disciplined and. So becoming, becoming an artist is like a question of refining yourself, which I think is like a very conservative notion at its heart, uh, heart right? Which is why so like the, art, the people who end up becoming artists are like the survivors of that process, basically. So, you know, like your right to become an artist gets taken away by saying that it's not creativity that you have, but it's like a primal state that needs to be sort of disciplined. So maybe it's like that kind of conservatism goes hand in hand with like the change from collective artistry to like individual her heroic artists you know uh, john uh, uh, earlier i'm oh, sorry i'm oh, sorry no it was me yeah i mean i actually i'll give you yeah i'll that will be you after yeah the um i really when i first read this I was just oh this is great and the, now that i'm spending a little more time on the first paragraph i think this assertion that uh, that the art world has purged this belief that, you know, we can all be artists again. I, now that I'm thinking about that, I don't even know if I agree with it. And I, I realize that the whole argument is kind of built upon it. And I don't want to sound like I'm defending the art world, but uh, just seeing like so much participatory artwork and these things that have this sense of play and try to draw people into this um, other way of thinking and, and interacting with art. So often I think does try to get at that sense that like we can all be artists. And I guess maybe a more accurate thing would be to say that we have this really fucked up system like the academies and the biennales, they don't want everybody to be an artist, but the actual artists themselves might somehow be working towards that goal. But then there's also this weird paradox that if successful, your career will be over because everybody will be an artist and there's no way to survive. So in that sense, I don't know, I guess I, I just thinking about it, I'm a little bit unsure about that assertion, but I don't know if it actually affects the, the argument further on. Yeah, someone was mentioning uh, Joseph Beuys, and this is, um, it seems to me that every freshman in, a, in an art school is very excited about um, you know, this idea that every man is an artist. So it, it seems to me that it's quite you know, um, uh, rooted in the art world, this uh, idea. But then people probably tend to forget about it and they become a bit less you know, um, interested in that anymore and wants to be successful and so on. Um, Clive. I've, I've just been floating back to something John said earlier about um, about um, uh, about oh, I've forgotten his name uh, uh, the uh, Kurt Schwitters um, Dardarists uh, they 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 basically tried to break up the idea of what the art world was and got you know now you can go and buy a Marcel Duchamp print you can you know they they have been basically placed within the same framework. So whatever you do, the framework effectively tries to take what you're doing and use it for its own means. So it tries to thrust its own values upon you, whether you like it or not. So it's sort of, you're kind of stuck in this, this sort of game, an art game where it's like, how, how do you, and when we were doing a lot of Work when Claire, Miles, and myself were doing a lot of work. It's like we just give it away, because actually that's the only way you break the system effectively. It's um, if you or not give it away. Don't allow people to buy it effectively. So you you take away the commercial value to try and. <laughs> 
creates a, another value that goes. There is actually an it. idea of a project um, back, back like months ago of doing artworks, getting artists to do, you know, really valuable in the market kind of stuff in a museum of care and then just giving it to people like, um, and you know, making, yeah, I think maybe we could try to resurrect this idea after this conversation. Yeah, one thing I was thinking about uh, art and freedom and the commodification and later in the article, it talks about how, you know, if it's a white male, it's that individual's genius. But if it's like, oh, an Iraqi refugee, it's like about the community. And that in, or, in order to maintain the, uh, the kind of commodification of is freedom, it has to be individualistic, right? You can't have community art. It's harder to have community arts that's commodified because how that's just distributed. And, and if everyone can be it, there's a like commodity, basically what I'm trying to get to is commodity is freedom is the only way to understand freedom if you're not communal. That sounds confusing, but. <laughs> okay, shall we, shall, shall we move to the, to the next paragraph? Oh, Nika, after, after that, yeah. And maybe something about the concept of culture that you are using in the second paragraph as well. Thanks. Nika, we, your, your mic is off. Yeah, I wanted to say that what Mark was saying is very true. Uh, you have to have this concept of genius, genius, geniuses to in order for whole system to work. And uh, all this collective art uh, is considered to be a folk art. And most of the four folk art is in the museums as a colonial loot. So it's like this African art and, you know, Indonesian art or whichever. And these mm -hmm. artists never had names. Uh, they all belong to some kind of, you know, vast uh, collection artifacts that was appropriated by metro Metropoli, like this British museum across the street from me. So that's a very different notion of culture. Yeah, and I that's, think- that's, um, uh, Yeah. Yeah. I think the very notion that they become folk art or traditional art, in fact, becomes negates the art part of that term because it 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 actually um, uh, asserts that it's the function of art in those societies isn't the function of art in this society. They are the the function of art in this society regulates like the access to freedom, uh, freedom of creativity in daily life. Whereas in like folk art, it's just an expression of the culture that we don't care that much about. That's true of craft, the definition, the borderline between art and craft. Um, and the idea is that you have some, there in some difference between what a craft, someone who creates, and, and, and Grayson Perry has done a lot of work to try and break that barrier down. But the, the idea that uh, in some way pottery is less, less of an art than painting and all of that. So you have this hierarchical system within, within the creation of things where one thing is better than another, which is just nonsense. By the way, speaking of uh, the museum as a secular church, um, there was a historian who researched the notion of genius uh, and because there was a, a belief, uh, there was a meaning of the word genius. Uh, so it meant something like a genie, something that we had in all of us. So when you produce something, you'd say, oh, it's my genius that did it. You know, it wasn't me, it was you know, some force within me that made it. So it kept you a little bit humble for one thing and everyone had a genius in them. And then as um, a secular movement came um, and uh, competed against the church, uh, the actual church, uh, they um, basically imitated a lot of its forms. So they, uh, the church had saints. So what do we make as saints? Well, we can have something called a genius. Uh, so as they replaced the church, instead of saints, they had genius. 
Hopkins and Newton was the first saint. Um, and I'll cite that in the quote where I got that from. Um, so I think it's pretty on topic to the idea of the, uh, um, the museum as the, the modern, what is it, temple or uh, holy place that replaced the church. Yeah, exactly. And also, um, as one, the two major revolutions uh, of the past, Russian Revolution and French Revolution, uh, started from taking over the king's palaces and turning them into the national museums in which uh, the very idea of this new sovereignty, the people supposed to be presented by this kind of genius, geniuses and geniuses artworks. Uh, that is now on display. So exactly right. So we so, should destroy these temples. <laughs> so um, since um, uh, TJ mentioned that, maybe maybe we should because we don't have you know we are quite constrained by the time. So maybe we should uh, move on and uh, go to I think one of the main uh, uh, theses of the of the of the paper. Which is uh, somewhere when they say what so they say some point why then the lingering power of industrial categories and industrial age mode of thought, the ultimate reason, it seems to us lies in our ability to detach ourselves from the notion of production. Um, so, what 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 did you understand from the text? Um, um, you know how you can explain uh, the persistence of this idea of um, this notion of. Um, of uh, genius as being an individual uh, um, uh, characteristic of, uh, of people. I think it's- Is it a question to me? I didn't understand uh, exactly that. Maybe somebody no, no, else can question, answer that. It's a question that for people. everyone. And I think, I think it would be good to hear people who didn't, who didn't say anything. Mm -hmm. And who wants to participate? But it's not, you know, it's not something that uh, well, nobody is forced to do. So, um, I'd like to talk about um, this idea of production that David talks about, and especially in relation to um, bullshit jobs. With the, um, you know, he addresses labor theory of value and bullshit jobs, and for me, he turned it on its head. And um, and like what this essay is pointing to is the. Um, the idea of making value not an ultimate production but at conception um, for example the idea of the woman in childbirth coming forth into the world the idea of an intrinsic value is created through um, well ultimately what Dave and what Nika are pointing at in my view is uh, maintenance and care work and it's remarkable and disabilities to do with Maori concepts of tapu um, for those that are familiar with um, <clears throat> when he addresses Māori concepts and um, possibilities. Um, I'd like to sort of introduce a book by a New Zealand lecturer by the name John Patterson. I'll include a link to the book. And it's about, he's a philosopher in uh, Māori ethics at Massey University and his book's called Exploring Māori Values. And it's this idea of Māori, this um, idea of essence and life force that um, that it's predominant in um, Māori concepts at what's called Te Ao Māori, the um, Māori worldview at the moment in the art world. And with any whaikore or speech or any um, process of karakia or prayer work before we do our artwork, we invoke um, this concept called um, katangi te titi, katangi te kaka, katangi hoki o, tihei Māori ora. And the tihei Māori ora is the sneeze of life. Um, and the sneeze of life was given from Tane when he separated the, um, the earth mother, Papatunuku, and the sky god, Rangi Nui. Um, and when he separated them, he created a woman from the, um, from the mother, Papatunuku, and created um, the first woman. And he breathed into her nose and said, Tiho Modi it was the sneeze of life. So in a lot of Māori art practices, the artisan or the weaver or the carver the, or the storyteller, they take raw form 
or this original production of life. And they, they're supposed to, in Māori tikanga or, or correct way of practices, to imbue it with a Māori life force. And this is seen as a tribal association to enhance kinship and tribal identity, um, taking from the land, the placenta of the woman, but nurturing it. And that's why the concepts of whanaunga tanga, um, it's big in New Zealand at the moment. We have a lot of children taken from their parents, um, from the state, um, um, from um, Oranga Tamariki, which is a ministry of the government. And quite a high number of children are taken from indigenous families, taken by the state. And there's been really um, big news at the moment about that in New Zealand and about abolishing Oranga Tamariki. And um, these concepts, a Māori concept of, uh, well, um, own collective tribal groups have um, coalesce together to form uh, whānau order, which is the concept of bringing it back to families and care work. And going back to this idea of this care work um, and to um, John Patterson's book, and I'll, I'll share the link to Exploring Māori Values, I think it's valuable um, because I, I noticed David, he talks in possibilities, he links to Johansson and I think uh, Percy Smith and they're quite contentious um, authors in a lot of uh, Māori academia and anthropologists. And I, I noticed um, when the Ho Journal, there was, um, um, with the problems in the Ho Journal, some Māori academics wrote an open letter um, to David um, concerning some of the aspects with, um, you, you know, you get it with a lot of European anthropologists talking about Indigenous culture. So I'd like to sort of just add a little bit of some of these um, small Māori concepts, and I'll keep it um, brief. Um, Puketapu Hetit, she talks about respecting your materials, respect your environment, respect the spiritual aspects of your work, respect all people. Um, it's, it's an idea of positive aspect injecting yourself into your manual labour. Another important concept is the Pākehā concept that Māori are trying to fight against, and it's the consumer and capital idea. And um, John Patterson talks about this. It's been detrimental to the work of Māori because it um, devalues our life-enhancing Māori, Māori or this care aspect of our work. This is also applied to relationships between men and women. Um, and when we talk about Modi, enhancing Modi, it's supposed to complement, we're supposed to complement one another. Um, he quotes Rangi Māori e Rose Pere, neither one is expected to transgress or infringe on another. It's way the Modi or the care group stays intact as well and so well-being so this is why I'm here in museum museum of care so that's my bit kia ora okay thank you thank you very much would you would you please add um, those references you mentioned in the in in our library that'd be yes. very helpful um I'll send you the link um anyone else uh, um, um about this um this notion of of production um as as a labor as opposed to maintenance and care, which I, I think is, is a very key idea of the paper. So, oh, Mark? Yeah, I just wanted to ask uh, Zoran, uh, where does he think, uh, or where do people think the border or the boundaries of the work of art end, or are they infinite? Um. There is no boundary per se, unless, say for example, um, there is one boundary though, and it's to do with the idea of the tapu or the sacred object. And for me, it's the idea of it being in a hierarchical um, plane compared to um, people. And there's where these aspects of class systems um, come into it. And they, they've been vigorously debated um, throughout Māoridom. There's um, radicals in the 70s, um, um, here's the actual radical that did the um, he showed his buttocks to the queen when she came here and he challenged a lot of these concepts of life force and, and sacredness of objects and putting them above people as well and putting people above people and I noticed that's what um, 
David talks about it in possibilities to do with um, the idea of tapu or the, or the rangatira or the chief and having ownership over people. And this is vigorously still debated, even though um, a lot of Māori are unaware of this on marae, but it's just the way we set up our, um, what they're called hapu meetings or our tribal meetings. There is, there is, there is still this push and pull um, dynamic of challenging those that are supposed to represent us um, in, in their relations to the Crown. And a lot of it is material arguments. Who's, who, uh, uh, how, how are people surviving the survival issues? Mm. Thanks. Someone who didn't have the chance to talk, or oh, uh, sorry, Mika, you want to say something? No, no, I'm just. Oh, can I just add as well, um, that's what interested me so much in these essays. I wish I had had them at art school because as a young Māori um, coming from a working class background um, at art school in the 1990s, any notion of the sacredness of art, because I was interested in European realism and the idea of what um, a lot of the German artists were talking about to do with um, modern art, like painters like Max Beckman, um, that was always frowned upon and it was seen as seen as wishy-washy romanticism. And that's why I think it's so fascinating, Nika, what you have done with David, is highlighting such a valuable, important aspect and actually putting it out there and ha having a conversation about it because it's really time we have a conversation about it. Because um, I think there has been this idea of a, too much of a rationalism approach um, in the art world. Um, and I think it goes back right through colonialism. Our first conquerors of New Zealand believed in Darwinian logic, um, or you know, Herbert Spencer type logic, so. Yeah, in, in another um, part of the um, idea of production is uh, that was developed later and that maybe we, we should try to develop in Museum of Care is a report of um, production and consumption with uh, care and freedom and related to art is uh, understanding uh, that the art pieces as well as any other objects, the the production is not stop when uh, you know we finish painting or we wrote the text. It's actually only the beginning. The same way as um, when the woman gave a birth to the child, then it's a years and years of work to raise this person, to educate this person. The person will become a human being. Um, and the same things with, uh, with, with art pieces, the most value is in care and not in the uh, object itself. Uh, yeah, and like later it's uh, in the other, another text, it's uh, there's this example with Leonardo da Vinci and Mona Lisa that was done once by Leonardo, but then thousands of people around the world for hundreds of years were, repainting that, talking about that, copying this, and so on and so forth. And most of these people, at least now, women, because if you look who is working in the libraries, who is museum guides, uh, who's taking um, kids to see it, who's teaching in schools, it's 70% um, of these people are women. But if you look at who is the creators, they, that's will be males. Um, and it's very much the same division, not only in art, but everywhere else. But we are talking about art as a, some very specific territory, that is not obviously not true. I we think that. To, to... I... Are you done, Nika? No, no, no. Okay. I think that the male-female division also exa exists in, um, like, cooking. Right? There's chefs, that, which are mostly males, and there's cooking is supposedly like a woman's activity. Um, I was actually going to add that another example of that difference is if you think about music and while most people stream, it's still a streaming service that's commodified and it's a product and so you're producing it and that's literally the, the term you use in music, like I'm producing this music, 
But then I think back to when I was in college, I studied in Argentina and lived like my host mother was this old grandma. And for her birthday, a bunch of her older friends got together and a guy brought a guitar and we just sang all night long. It was a really beautiful experience. And even though it was not at all common, it was a caring experience, you know, it was a community experience. And the same songs could have been sung as if it was on, you know, a CD or a record or something like that. But the the change in medium and the change in, in commodification changed the experience of it completely. Yeah, I, that makes me think about novelty. And because in that scenario, of course, those songs were probably very familiar songs. They weren't, you know, new products, yeah. products were they? they? They were, of course, very familiar. And and the importance of it was that they were brought and in given life in a context where people could share and, and take part and not that they were new. And, and I wonder if there's, a, if there's something to say about productionism, this idea that production is the ultimate work, if that relates to novelty as the ultimate value, the fact that something new supersedes what came before it um, and, and that, and that, I mean, I wonder if that connects to this kind of acceleration of the art world, just constantly, you know, just um, disposing of what's gone before and being superseded, uh, or, or, and a notion of progress that actually the new thing, the next new thing actually represents something better or more advanced or more further on some kind of progression towards some kind of goal. Um, so I wonder how novelty relates to production, is it, in essence. Yeah, I, mean, I think that that kind of makes me think of like the almost like the theological idea, right? In Judeo-Christian philosophy, of um, you know, like something from nothing, or like uh, like that, like 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 a rupture kind of, which leads to the creation of something new. Uh, and um, because you know, like like God creates everything from nothing, like this universe from uh, uh, from nothingness, essentially. And like, we still have also like this area of new, you know, I mean, it's used so much in advertising as well, right? If you want to sell more of your product, it can be the exact same product. You just say that it's new, put a sticker and then, you know, people buy it more. Um, so yeah, maybe like some religious overtones there, undertones. It reminds us also what, the, what, what is said in the text, in the second section of this, uh, of this part um, about, uh, the Biennale or the Documenta, um, and this idea that you have to create something new, make it a, make it a historic event. Shall we? Shall we move to 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 this paragraph? And and maybe um, try to understand what are the rules um, of uh, the art world, because I think this is this is what this section is about. Unrelated, but I just had a um, thought. Um, interesting that um, the icebreaker today was to choose someone that you thought was special or produced something interesting so you could have lunch with it. And now we're talking about uh, the whole individualism in the art world. And yeah, I was so stuck in individualism. It's crazy. <laughs> but um, yeah, it's uh, I, I study art history and I've been reading a lot about the Romans, Romans. I think, uh, yeah, all of this was so present there in those times. I think our individualism and, and also cult of the individual and heroic individual really comes from there. And it's so difficult to get rid of it, even a little bit. I don't know what to say, sorry, I, I wish I could say something more hopeful, <laughs> but let's try. Um, I, I, I wanted to ask, I, I can't recall who, who made the comment about like the genie or, or the spirit of the muse that, that lives in all of us. 
DJ um, I, mentioned that. I, well, I'm, I'm particularly glad to see Spinoza in the Library of Care because that the, those those his thinking seems related. The the notion of we are all aspects of the divine. It's funny because I've actually just added it because there is this um, um, paragraph about um, pain and and suffering, uh, which is related to production and um, and labor, and I think in in part four of the ethics, you, know, you, you reminded me that. So I, I just, I, I've just only just added to the to the library. Anyone wants to um, that we didn't didn't hear? It's already nine o'clock. Um. I mean. Um... I could throw a question. I mean, this, so, you know, um, it's not something I know I'm, I'm sure about either, but I um, think recently, you know, we had um, like that amazing PDF of David's uh, lectures being uploaded. Uh, so I was going through that and, you know, it's supposed to be a lecture, a bunch of lectures about social theory. But what's interesting is, you know, I mean, if you think of social theory now, you just think of social scientists. But if you look at if, like people thinking about social theory like 200 years ago, it's the same people who are also thinking about natural science, you know, like, like Emmanuel Kant. And so, you know, like I, I, Albert Einstein's favorite book, I finally for some time was um, Kant's, um, that f famous book of his, I forget the name, but uh, like the big famous book around space and time and so on. Um, so, you know, it's, it's like, you know, and that's also like two, two, 300 years ago around that time is also we see like the idea of romanticism take root, you know? So I wonder like back then, like like the, yes, that's the one, David. Yes, that's the one, that's the one, critic of pure reason. Um, so, you know, like it seems like two, 300 years ago, the romantics and other social theor theorists were just as much natural scientists and philosophers. Um, but I, I wonder if like now, like it's also like, you know, we, we, we we're talking about the change from collective to individual genius. I don't know, has, has there been like a change from uh, social theory only being able to talk about, or like back then social theory was able to talk about not just society, but also like nature and the world as a whole. And now it can only talk about society, you know? Uh, so I wonder if that change has also happened hand in hand, like, you know, so you have this change from collective to individual and then also from like, like a combination of nature and culture to now it's just like a very big separation between nature and culture. I don't know if that made sense, but yeah. So I read a really interesting article about uh, the concept of like polymaths, people that are good at multiple things, right? And it made me this, we're talking about splitting the artist into two of that, the creative side and the productive side. Um, but one of the things that I think even for, you know, our geniuses like Einstein, there's all these things, oh, he was a rational mathematical thinker. And you actually look at his biography and he talks about how he thinks of physics and the music and then communicate and then translates that musical concepts into uh, math so he can do write a science article. Right. And it, and it goes through all these other people that look at one discipline from skills they've understood in other disciplines. And it's, I think it's that same thing of that whole person. And we like to these days very much divide. Oh, you're a scientist. You're a musician. You're this one thing. And we're not whole people anymore. Uh, and I think that's one of those, I can definitely see what you're saying, Yash. Like we've been, you know, divided into all these different ideas, but being a whole people makes you a more powerful, more amazing scientist because you can use your musical side to understand the scientific side and vice versa. That's exactly it. And I mean, that's kind of why I also really love like indigenous philosophies, like what Zaran was talking about, because mm -hmm. Like, like that distinction isn't necessarily there, you know, and doesn't have to be, you know, between like society and nature. It doesn't necessarily have to be there. Yeah. It's interesting to think about hyper specialties, both in the sciences and arts being pushed. So artists are encouraged to really develop that single vision and to not become polymaths. Um, another thing I was thinking about, sorry to keep going if we're over time here, um, 
how the idea of um, productive labor is uh, diminished in this sort of labor that's non-productive uh, in the sort of Adam Smith sense that's put into art then makes art valuable in the market, right? So all the attention that's paid to it by curators and gallerists that denote it as being something valuable, it's not the art itself. Right, as we said, there's a million copies of the Mona Lisa. I so. wonder if um, the, the artist at the, at the top of this sort of pyramid of what freedom is in under capitalism is also paralleled by the art object as the, the ultimate commodity um, under capitalism. And, 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 and so if, if the sort of the essence of the valuable thing is that it's a thing <laughs> and it has to be produced, um, well, that all, it almost just that instantly just denigrates and devalues any other kind of work, which maybe just transports or maintains or cares. I'm aware I just said just um, to, to just actually um, <laughs> be an example of that ideology. Sorry. <laughs> when when Aisha was facilitating this trading group, she was um, she was uh, telling people oh because she wanted to hear more uh, women. It seems that many men uh, had had something to say, but uh, what about? Um, the women of this group, there are, there are, there are, there are a few, I think. I was actually reading the chat about the book on making, and I would like to know a bit more about it. I don't have a comment at the moment. The making versus... Um, Sorry. Okay. Oh, yeah. No, it's not great. It's not David. Uh, I, missed, nice. I missed it. There are so we many things going on with this chat. This is insane. In the library? <laughs> oh, yeah. It's good. And there's some stuff about like this idea of anti design in there. I remember being quite enjoyable and a lot of stuff about axe handles. It's really great. I'm a really big fan of it. And, and in it, uh, he does two important things, I think. In one, he says that when we try to find out about things, the notion of inquiry and Aristotelian idea, this is not, um, he, he, he despises the idea of agency, that things can have an agency, he views it as a profoundly anti-ethical position. But he, he emphasizes the idea that finding out about things is a spiritual endeavor. And its purpose is spiritual enhancement or enrichment, not gathering data or measuring stuff. That's one important thing that he does. And for me, another important thing that he does is that he slightly debunks or disabuses part of how I think production has been spoken about in the last half an hour by saying, it's not the case that things spring fully formed from the mind. It's the case that things tend to cohere over time as we enter into what he calls correspondence but what Cheximent Mihai calls flow and what other philosophers have other terms for. But, but, but what he's talking about is a, a engaged material relation that unfolds over time. And, and for me, that's the opposite of how perhaps we've been positioning art, the artist, production and genius. And um, I, I just think it's an important thing to, to sort of know about that that there is a whole other way of talking about this and of thinking about it. And I think Ingold does it really well uh, in this book. It, you loses the plot in the last third where he turns towards architecture, which is always a profound sign of um, an idea beginning to fall apart. Thank you. Um, anyone else? Maybe we can um, wrap this uh, discussion up and talk about the, the political implication of, uh, of this um, of this part of the text, um, which is you know towards the end they say um, you know maybe politics is about um, uh, thinking about how we could organize the society differently. 
because it seems that they make like a very um, pressing observation, but then they're like, no, no, let's be optimistic. There is some, there is something to do. What, what is it to do? I mean, if I if I may, uh, maybe not directly related, but I was thinking about because we we know that David Graeber was influenced by the Italian autonomist thought, right? And I was thinking about um, Mario Tronti's uh, book that has been recently translated into English in full, Work Ex and Capital, originally published, I think, in '62 or something like that. Uh, a very important book for the entire sort of you know autonomous movement in which Tronti basically says that all culture is bourgeois and it must be abolished as such. So there's like no, um, you know, talk about some kind of proletarian culture or, you know, uh, emancipatory, emancipatory culture um, as a project, as something to be created or something to, that, that is already emerging perhaps in uh, certain enclaves. So <clears throat> I was wondering whether there is a, I mean, contradiction here, or maybe David Graeber wasn't um, that much influenced by this line of Marxist thought. It's just, uh, you know, j just something that um, came up to my mind, maybe not, not, not related, but, you know, the, the more general question is whether, you know, um, what, what, should be, what should be done with culture? Um, should there be a culture, some, some kind of separate set of institutions and, and artifacts. I mean, in communism, of course. Um, Nika, when do we have to stop this? Uh, I think we should wrap up, yeah? Yeah. Because we are like, the idea was we only one hour, but today we have Every, every Friday, but only one hour. But today we'll have a little bit, half an hour more discussion that we wanted to have after. Mm. So, yeah, I just so wanted to ask Nika yes, uh, to some very quickly because I didn't understand. Uh, what does it mean, uh, what should be done with culture? Because, uh, yeah, so every society, every human society have culture no matter what. We don't need to do anything specific with culture. It's always there. Um, and uh, if we talk about communism uh, and art communism and, and what we were trying to, to, to is, uh, is just by rearranging the ideas uh, of how to produce symbolic value, you may affect the wider societal structures. And that's what all social movements trying to do in a different ways. So that's my understanding of what we try. Mitya, do you want to reply to that? Yeah, I guess, uh, I mean, my question was uh, a bit uh, like uh, a, a provocation because of course we can, I mean, there is a very uh, established like distinction between culture in general and culture as something like aesthetically valued or high culture. So basically culture as being uh, roughly synonymous with uh, social life and culture as some separated sphere, some kind of, uh, you know, as, as, as a part of, of, of the social life. And it must be introduced before any discussion of culture, but I was just generally interested in, uh, you know, in, in, in this may be not, not directly relevant to our discussion, but how much David Graeber was uh, sort of following Tronti, because I, I guess Tronti wouldn't be very fond of Prolet Kult, for instance. So there may be perhaps a topic for another discussion later, uh, and I'm just sort of throwing it out. Yeah, and, and the discussion can continue in the Google Doc for those who are interested. And we we can I suppose we can take a, just a few questions. Let, let's let's give us a t two two more minutes. One minute now. One minute now. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. 
Should we make a um, two minute break before going to the next part of the, the meeting? <laughs> I can, okay. Uh, so in two minutes, when we come back, it will be 16. Um,